Among the options on the beer wall at Walter's Sports Bar are Annapolis IPA, Green City IPA, Raised by Wolves, and Vienna Lager. Walters is located across the street from Nationals Park. Whether you're a world-class athlete or a podcaster like me, we all understand the importance of mental and physical well-being and proper recovery for top-notch performance. That's why I'm excited that Unified Healing is sponsoring podcasts on the Blue Wire Network. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers powered by Energy Enhancement System, or EE System. If you haven't heard of the EE System yet, then you'll want to listen up. This technology promotes wellness, deep relaxation, purification, and rejuvenation. Wherever you are across the globe, access to a center is easy and affordable. Interested in experiencing the EE System technology for yourself? Go to unifiedhealing.com slash bluewire to learn more and find a center near you. That's unified, U-N-I-F-Y-D, healing.com slash blue wire. No material or testimonials on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new healthcare regimen, including EE system. So here's Winker who singled to left and walked. And the pitch swinging a ground ball toward the hole, through in the right field, a base hit. Abrams around third being waved home by Ricky Gutierrez. He'll score standing without a play as the throw goes into second for the right fielder Perez. Two runs across for the Nationals here in the fifth with three hits, still only one out. It's the Nationals four, the Tigers one. Now the pitch. Swing a bouncing ball left side toward the hole. Kreidler gets there. He'll make a long off balance throw. It's too late. Garcia beats it out as Thomas scores. And the Nationals are back in front by two. Now the pitch. Swing a bouncing ball toward the middle. Garcia, the second baseman to the right of second, has it. He sets. He throws to Manessis. And a curly W and a five game winning streak are in the books here at Comerica Park in Detroit. And welcome to Nats Chat for Thursday, June 13th. 2024, along with MadisonSports.com Nationals insider Mark Zuckerman, who was at Comerica Park in Detroit. I'm Al Galdi, host of the Al Galdi podcast. What was going on in your life in June 2021? The Nationals have just done something that they had not done since June 2021. Register a regular season winning streak of at least five games. Wednesday evening, a 7-5 win at the Detroit Tigers in game two of a three-game series. The Nats for this regular season now are 32 and 35. The Nats now are scoring some runs, 27 runs over the team's last four games. This installment of the Nats Chat Podcast brought to us by Mason Kalfas and his team of 10 legal recruiters at Zenith Legal in Washington, D.C. Check out Mason's website today, zenithlegal.com, or call or text Mason at any time, 202-486-3535. The Nats on Wednesday evening got another good outing from starting pitcher Jake Irvin. Did get a not-so-good game from the bullpen, but got another good game from the offense. Seven runs, 13 hits, five walks. You know, Mark, if you look at your National League standings, 15 teams in the NL, a mere five of them have winning records. The Nats are not one of those five teams, but the Nats soon could be one of the winning teams in the NL. The National League is really wide open once you get beyond those top few teams. And so if you are a Nats fan, perhaps you can think some forbidden thoughts right now with how well this team is playing. A lot of possibilities appear to be in the air. You know, Al, I'm looking at it right now. As we record this, they are officially one game out of the wild card race. Now, the problem is there are one, two, three, four, five, six teams ahead of them for that last spot. Everybody is bunched in there together, just a couple games under 500. Obviously, a long way to go. It's too early to talk about any of that. But we haven't had a chance to talk about this kind of stuff in quite a while. We started this podcast in 2021. They got off to a bad start that year. They had a great June, and we thought, okay, here they go. This has some 2019 vibes to it. And then it all fell apart, as we know. We don't have to rehash what's happened in the three years since then, but to see it starting to come together again. They're not playing perfect baseball. No, they've got issues for sure, but they've won five in a row and you don't do that without having something going well for you right now. I think it's a big step for them. I think there's more of this to come. And while they may not be quite ready to get over that ultimate hump that they want to get to, I think it feels a lot closer than it has in a long time. 
Well, if the offense is finally awakening, and that is an if, the Nats in this series are playing a bad Tigers team. The Tigers are not impressive, okay? If you are watching these games, the Tigers are sloppy. The Tigers are not very good. That the Tigers have the halfway decent record that they have seems like a minor miracle if you're watching this series. But if the Nats offense is coming around That changes everything because the pitching has been like sitting and waiting for the offense to catch up. If the offense is catching up at least somewhat, then you are really cooking. Uh, So we shall see. But with the pitching, Jake Irvin, you cannot say enough good things about the season that this guy is having. Another good outing on Wednesday evening. One run in six innings, five strikeouts versus one walk. He gave up six hits, which were a solo homer and five singles. He again threw a ton of strikes, 98 pitches, 69 strikes versus just 29 balls. What's odd is that the outing did not begin in a very good way. Bottom of the first, he gave up a leadoff full count homer by Matt Veerling to left field for a one nothing Tigers lead. Also gave up back-to-back one-out singles. Did not look sharp. And then he became sharp, and he ended up having a rather impressive outing. Something changed. A switch was flipped, and Irvin went from being rather unimpressive to once again very impressive. So the first four batters he faced, every single one of them hit the ball hard, including the leadoff homer by Matt Vierling, but then a line out to left and back-to-back base hits. And maybe it's just you know, we've set the bar high here with him because he's been so good. I'm thinking to myself, is he tipping his pitches or something? Like It looks like they know what's coming. That's how good these swings are against him. And it wasn't just on one pitch. It was on multiple different types of pitches. So I asked around a little bit after the game, and the answer was definitively – No, they worried about the same thing, but they looked at it. They didn't find anything at all. He didn't make any kind of adjustment in that regard. He just started pitching a little bit smarter. He started using his changeup a little bit more, was just a little better location, understanding what to throw to which hitter. And you're right. It was a switch that was flipped. He went the next seven batters, retired them all, three of them on strikeout. And really, you know, aside from maybe a little hiccup in the fifth inning, he cruised the rest of the way. And that's been this thing about him. And, And It's like he's not just getting through all this with good stuff. I think he's growing as a pitcher and learning how to be an effective pitcher. To be able to make an in-game adjustment with some help from K. Barrett Ruiz, as I was told, is big for him and the growth for him. I don't think we can overstate how significant a development this has been. Jake Irvin now with a three ERA even, 67 games into the year, a 5-5 and record that should be better because he's gotten very little run support aside from a few nights like this one. He is really pitching like a frontline big league starter. And I don't know that anybody in their wildest dreams saw that coming right now. The whip is at 1.04, best among Nat starting pitchers. And I'm glad that you mentioned K. Bert Ruiz. I was thinking about this today. So K. Bert is having a horrible season as a batter and as a fielder. But when we talk about the Nats impressive starting pitching, should we not be giving K Baird at least some of the credit as a receiver, as a game caller? Because in that regard, it would seem that he is doing a pretty good job. Now, again, his defensive numbers are really bad. So framing, throwing out base runners, defensive runs saved, all of those things, not good. But when it comes to handling the pitching staff, calling a game, I do think, to be fair, we should give him some credit for the surprisingly good starting pitching that the Nats have put forth this season. Yeah, I agree. If you want to credit Sean Doolittle, if you want to credit Jim Hickey, you want to credit the pitchers who've done this, I absolutely think the catchers are a part of that. And Ruiz is by far and away the number one catcher who's out there the most. He's been in the league long enough to start learning how to call games, how to set hitters up, how to figure out what's working, what's not working. And you've also seen here, I've noticed it the last two nights, but I feel like I've seen this a decent amount this year as well. He's making a point to have some mound visits and not wait for Jim Hickey to go out there. That's a sign of growth from him and taking charge on his own for that. It is a big part of it. It's hard to quantify how much difference it makes or not. But I do think what he is doing in terms of working with the pitching staff has been a part of this. You don't just get this good across the board with just coaching or with just the pitcher suddenly being better. It's a group effort and the catcher absolutely has to be a part of that. Hey, are you a law firm partner or associate looking for an upgrade from AAA 
to the majors. Don't be stuck in Rochester like James Wood. Step up to the big leagues by getting the best legal recruiter in D.C. on your team, Mason Kalfis and his team of 10 legal recruiters at Zenith Legal in Washington, D.C. Many lawyers think that they are stuck at firms with inferior resources, management, or compensation, but it is still an active lateral market with top firms looking to poach talent from competitors. And unlike a prospect's move up to the majors, you will find the new firm can make your practice easier. Better resources, better cross-selling opportunities, and better branding to win business from prospective clients. Don't be stuck in Fredericksburg when you are a Washington, D.C. level talent in litigation, regulatory, or corporate legal practices. Mason Kalfas will discuss your practice and clients with you and help you find a better platform to increase your compensation and career trajectory. He has placed partners in over half of the Amlaw 100 law firms, and his candidates rave about the excellent service and their new jobs. Mason also is well known for working with senior government lawyers at the DOJ, SEC, and White House to find positions in top Washington, D.C. law firms. Check out his website today, zenithlegal.com, or call or text him anytime, 202-486-3535. Go Nats! Hey listeners, Tim Shover's here to tell you about an offer on the Game Time app. There's a sporting event going on this weekend in the DMV you might not be aware of. Argentina's national soccer team, the defending World Cup champions, take on Guatemala this Friday night in Landover, Maryland, at what is now known as Commander's Field. There are tickets available on Game Time. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code NATSCHAT for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code NATSCHAT for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. Price Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 5 million active members. Get in on the daily action with your friends and become part of the Prize Picks community today. The finals mean more on Prize Picks, and so do the star players. You get boosted payouts on select basketball stars that you won't find anywhere else. And when the finals are over, the hoops action doesn't stop on Prize Picks because women's basketball is just getting started. With young stars like Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese looking to make names for themselves, alongside greats like Brianna Stewart and Asia Wilson, you could win up to 100 times your cash. Watch them ball out. This week on Prize Picks, I'm looking at the basketball board and selecting Jalen Brown for more than 25 points, Tyrese Halliburton for more than 10 assists, and Jason Tatum for more than 10 rebounds. Download the app today and use code BLUEWIRE for a first deposit match up to $100. That's code BLUEWIRE on the Prize Picks app for that first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. <laughs> Here's your Dylan Cruz and Brady House update for the game played on Wednesday. Cruz went two for four with two RBIs, including a double. House, he homered one for four in the game, knocked in two runs as well. Cruz's OPS is at 771 on the year. House at 737. Now back to the show. He comes set on three and two. The kick, here it comes. Swing and a pop-up. Playable in the infield. Abrams and Garcia both there. And Abrams, the shortstop, makes the catch in front of the second baseman, Garcia. And the inning is over. And what a job by Hunter Harvey to get out of that. He comes in with a runner at second. Nobody out and strands that runner right there. So Jake Irvin in this game was good. The Nats bullpen in this game, not good. Save for one guy who once again came through in a big spot. So four Nats relievers combined to allow four runs in three innings. Robert Garcia officially allowed one run in one inning. Dylan Floro, who overall has had a good season, he was a mess in this game. He officially allowed two runs without recording it out. He had a very rough eighth inning, what ended up being a three-run eighth for the Tigers. Floro came into the game Bottom of the eighth with a runner on first, no outs, and the Nats holding a pretty comfortable 5-1 lead, but Floro gave up a single by Mark Canna through the left side of the infield on a 1-2 pitch. Floro gave up an opposite field single by Colt Keith to left field, and then left fielder Jesse Winker on the single committed a fielding error, and Floro gave up a two-run double by Gio Urshela to left field. 
all was done. The Nats lead had been trimmed from 5-1 to 5-4. Then Hunter Harvey happened. So he gets summoned into this game. Bottom of the eighth, runner on second, nobody out. Nats now clinging to a 5-4 lead. And Harvey does what he has done so many times this season. He comes through in a high leverage spot, retires each of the three batters he faces. Another tremendous outing by Hunter Harvey. And then we had Kyle Finnegan. He did allow a run in the bottom of the ninth on a one-out solo homer, but he got the save. The Nats got two, what turned out to be very important insurance runs in the top of the ninth. So a bit of an adventure with the Nats bullpen in this game. But man, Hunter Harvey once again delivering. Davey clearly did not want to have to use either Harvey or Finnegan in this game. And, you know, we'll get to the offense. There were multiple opportunities. I know they scored seven runs. There were multiple opportunities for them to blow this game open and not even have to consider using their top two relievers. But they didn't. And when Garcia and Floro, really for the first time in a while, struggled to that extent, he didn't hesitate to call on his best guy there to get out of that jam. And I don't fault him for it. He threw 32 pitches the night before. I get it. I think we have now gotten past the point that you have to baby Hunter Harvey because of his past injury history. Yes, you have to watch him, but I think he's built up enough goodwill now in the last year plus to say we can treat him like almost any other reliever and trust him to say when he's not feeling right. He felt good enough. He actually said he felt better in this one than he did the night before. So to come in in that spot, all of a sudden a game that looked like it was a comfortable win is a one-run game with the tying run and scoring position and nobody out. And he comes right in, bam, 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 one, two, three, gets out of it. You know, we've said this over and over again. Finnegan is the closer. Finnegan gets the most credit. Hunter Harvey very often gets the most important outs in a game. And in this one, that 100% was the case. He is having some season. And, you know, we'll see who from the Nats gets selected to the National League All-Star team. I think it's a fun conversation. There are a good number of Nationals players now who you can really talk about legitimately as having arguments. He has one, especially when you look at some of the advanced stats like win probability added. Harvey rates very well in something like that because, again, coming through so often in these high leverage spots, really can't say enough good things about the season that he has had. So we mentioned Finnegan giving up that home run in the ninth inning. That ended up not being that big of a deal because the Nats offense got those two runs in the top of the ninth and scored seven runs in this game. The Nats for the game, seven runs, 13 hits, which were a home run, three doubles and nine singles, five walks, four for 16 with runners in scoring position. Two of the Nats extra base hits came from C.J. Abrams, who perhaps is finally getting going again here. Uh, Abrams, as the Nats starting shortstop and number one batter, two for five with a solo homer and an RBI double. Abrams in a Nats one-run third, a two-out solo homer to right field to tie the game at one. The homer went a projected 404 feet per stat cast. And Abrams in the Nats three-run fifth, an opposite field RBI ground rule double to the left center field gap for a 3-1 Nats lead. It's interesting when you look at Abrams. Excellent April, terrible May, and he, in this month of June, has sort of had a combination of April and May. The batting average is not good. The on-base percentage is not good. But Abrams, for June, now has a slugging percentage of 576. He's hitting for big-time power in this month. This is exactly what we saw from him in April from a standpoint of hitting for power. That was such a a big feature of his very good April. And uh, at least from a power-hitting standpoint, we're seeing April C.J. Abrams in this month of June. Yeah, it's six of his last seven hits have been for extra bases. So is he coming through with singles and walks? No, not a whole lot of that. But when he does do something, they've been big, meaningful hits and driving it either over the fence or to the gaps and then using his speed to get around the bases. So maybe not all the way back to what we saw from him in April, but certainly getting there. He said he's been able to be much more selective with his swing choices, shrinking the strike zone so he's not chasing as much and able to swing at the pitches that he knows he should be able to do something with. And that has been the case here. So it's a good step. You need to see this over a little more longer period of time. You do want to see more singles in addition to all the extra base hits and everything else. But I think there's enough here now in the last week to say he's out of that really bad funk that he was in. He looked bad at times there, as we discussed, and he seemed to be kind of taking it himself 
maybe not so well. So I think he hit a homer against the Braves that kind of snapped him out of that. And ever since then, he's hit the ball really with authority, and that's been a very pleasant development for them. Another standout for the Nats in this 7-5 win at the Tigers on Wednesday evening, Jesse Winker, the on-base machine. Winker, as the Nats' starting left fielder and number three batter, got on base four more times. He went two for three with an RBI single, another single, and two walks. He did commit that aforementioned key fielding error, but Winker in the top of the first, a two-out opposite field single through the left side of the infield. Winker in the top of the third, a tremendous walk, a two-out eight pitch walk despite having been down in the count at 1.02. Winker in the Nats, three-run fifth, a one-out first pitch RBI single through the right side of the infield for a 4-1 Nats lead. And Winker in the Nats, two-run ninth, drew a walk despite having been down in that count at 1.12. He is consistently giving the Nats some of their best played appearances, game in, game out. And don't look now, but Jesse Winker for this regular season is number 10 among all qualified players in the majors in on-base percentage at 380. I mean, we are approaching the numerical midpoint of the 162-game campaign. Winker has an on-base percentage of 380. You know, we're not at trade deadline conversation talk yet, but this is going to be really interesting. You have Kyle Finnegan and Hunter Harvey having dynamite seasons. You have Jesse Winker with a 380 on base. You have some real legitimate trade chips here as the Nats are uh, plowing through this season and, of course, are very much in wild card contention themselves. But boy, Jesse Winker, who had the hot start, then cooled off, he now has gotten right back to being in a very good place. 380, as you said, on base percentage, that's entering the territory of some other guys who used to bat third for this team. Bryce Harper, Juan Soto territory. Maybe it would start with a four before we really get into that ground with him, but it's been impressive to see. He is extremely patient at the plate. I get a kick out of this. He strikes out looking a lot. It's among the league leaders in that. Every time he gets a called third strike, he argues with the umpire as if he is convinced that it was the wrong call. Most of the time it was not. Sometimes it was. And in fact, in this game, the one time he made an out, a called third strike, and it was a bad call. So he should have reached base five times with three walks in the game. So he's patient, but then when he does get something to hit, he is doing something with it. So it's a good combination to have for a guy hitting third every day now on this team. And another thing that coming out of spring training, this is not what you saw coming, I don't think. And you know we've got plenty of time to talk trade deadline stuff, but I will say this. I think Winker is in a different category than the others. One-year contract picked up by the minor league free agent. And I know he's helping this team out a lot, but there's reason to believe that there will be others who could step into that role who are a part of their future here before the end of the season, maybe even before the trade deadline. So moving him does not necessarily equate to the team saying, we're selling, we're not trying to win this year. I think there's a way, we got a ways to go, of course, but I think there is a scenario in which you could trade Jesse Winker at the deadline and still be trying to win and contend if they can hang around in the wild card race because of who's still to come in the outfield for them. Well, we in recent years have seen teams at trade deadlines that are on the periphery of contending kind of have the cake and eat it too. So you act as a seller, but you remain in contention. You maybe sell, but you don't sell quite as hard as you otherwise would if you weren't doing as well as you are doing. So the Nats right now would appear to be in that territory. Again, we have a ways to go till the deadline, but uh, some things to be thinking about. Hey guys, it's Al Galdi for Window Nation, which has another great offer for listeners of the Nats Chat Podcast. Window Nation is extending its semi-annual sale, 50% off all window styles, plus 0% interest for five years, and an additional bonus if you schedule an appointment between now and and the end of this month. Call 866-90NATION or visit windownation.com and tell Window Nation that Al Galdi sent you. Window Nation windows are the best. Add to the look, feel, and value of your home. Every Window Nation window undergoes a 50-point inspection before the window leaves the Window Nation factory. And know that Window Nation's vinyl windows can do everything that wood or composite windows can do and at a fraction of the cost of wood and composite windows. Take advantage of this offer for listeners of the Nats Chat Podcast. 50% off all window styles plus 0% interest for five years and an additional bonus if you schedule an appointment between now and the end of this month. 
866-90NATION or windownation.com. That's 866-90NATION or windownation.com. And tell Window Nation that you want the deal that you heard about from Al Galdi on the Nats Chat Podcast. From groan-worthy dad jokes to patching up skin knees, your dad is one of a kind. This Father's Day, give him a gift that is guaranteed to take him to his happy place, Omaha Steaks. Order mouth-watering gift packages starting at just $89 when you go to omahasteaks.com and use promo code NATSCHAT at checkout. Each package is backed by their unconditional money-back guarantee. Show your dad the love he deserves with a gift as unforgettable as he is. Visit omahasteaks.com, promo code NATSCHAT at checkout. This Father's Day, the Home Depot has same-day delivery on the perfect gift to help dad be everything he can be. Because your dad is more than just a dad. He's groundskeeper of the yard, the perfecter of the patio, and the cleaner of the clippings. Let the Home Depot help power dad's doing with the convenience and gas-like power of Milwaukee cordless outdoor tools. Plus, get up to $150 off select Milwaukee tools. For everything dad is, find the perfect gift at the Home Depot. How doers get more done. Order select and stock items by 4 p.m. subject to availability. Here's the set. Garcia's running. The pitch is outside. The throw one hop and skips into center field, and Winker can trot home from third base. Unbelievable. Garcia will get a stolen base, his ninth in nine tries this year. And the one hop throw from the catcher, Kelly skips into center field, so Winker trots in to score. And some boo birds coming out here at Comerica Park. It's now the Nationals five and the Tigers one. We mentioned the Jesse Winker 380 on base. Another statistical item from this game, the 100 stolen base plateau for the Nats as a team. Luis Garcia Jr., he is an ad starting second baseman and number five batter, went two for five with an RBI single and an infield single. He in that two-run ninth had a one-out opposite field RBI single to the left side of the infield for a 6-4 Nats lead. But Garcia in the three-run fifth, a one-out fielder's choice grounder on what was essentially a check swing toward third base that resulted in multiple rundowns, including Eddie Rosario being tagged out between second and third base. There were some more odd moments in this game, as was the case in game one. There were some more ugly moments (laughs) in this game, as was the case in game one. But Garcia gets on base, then has a steal of second base that prompts a throwing error by Tigers catcher Carson Kelly, allowing Jesse Winker, who had survived a rundown between third base and home plate, to score from third base for a 5-1 Nats lead. But here's the point with the 100 stolen base plateau. Garcia Steele was the Nats' 100th stolen base of this regular season. The Nats' last regular season did not get to 100 stolen bases until August 29th. I mean, you think about that. Wednesday night, was June 12th. The Nats just got to some place that they had not gotten to last season until August 29th on June 12th of this season. It's been a weird deal with the Nats on the base pass. We all get that. We've talked about that. A lot of outs, especially lately, the Nats have not had a high success rate on stolen bases. But geez, that really does stand out, getting to 100 stolen bases so much sooner as compared to last season. Yeah, and remember last year, the rules were in place. So they're playing by the same rules. This is not a pre-larger bases, maximum number of pickoff throws kind of thing. So they have made it a point. We've discussed this. They decided from the get-go, we may not hit for power, but we have guys who can steal bases and we're going to use that to our advantage. And I almost feel like there's a little money ball aspect to this. I don't know if you know they're thinking in quite the same terms as Billy Bean was all those years ago, but I think right now they're realizing you can beat other teams in a way that maybe other teams haven't quite picked up on yet. It's a very affordable way to try to build an offense if you don't have the ability to go sign sluggers or develop your own. Stolen bases can come kind of cheap. So sort of like the old on-base revolution, there's a little stolen base revolution that maybe they're ahead of the curve on, actually. And all the credit in the world to them for doing that and figuring that out. 67 games to get to 100 steals. No team in the majors had done that since 2009. And the previous team before that, they were all in the 1990s. So this is a whole brave new world that they're in. And I feel like they are at the forefront of it and good for them for figuring that out. Yes, they can be better at it. They ran into three outs in this game. That's not going to work in the long run. But they are finding a way to maximize what they get from this lineup, given what their constraints are. 
Yeah, and for the season, 100 for 129 on stolen bases. That does work out to an efficiency of 77.5%, which is acceptable. I think the problem is that early in the year, it was like nearly 100%. It's over the last, like, I don't know, six weeks or so that that number has come down. But yes, 100 steals, you can work with that for sure. And uh, the Nats have done that. That is something to get to that number this early in the season. So the Nats get production from C.J. Abrams, get production from Jesse Winker, get production from Luis Garcia Jr., also get production from Joey Manessis, who I guess you would say now is back to being the every game first baseman. We'll see. The Nats on Wednesday uh, did officially announce having placed Joey Gallo on the 10-day injured list with the left hamstring strain that he suffered in the 5-4-10 inning win at the Tigers on Tuesday evening. I want to get to the corresponding roster move in a moment, but Manessis on Wednesday evening as the Nats starting first baseman and number six batter, two for four with a double, an RBI single, and a walk. Uh, He and the Nats, one run fourth, a one-out full count ground rule double to left field, top of the eighth, a walk, and Manessis in the Nats, two run ninth, a one-out RBI single into left field for a 7-4 Nats lead. There are a lot of teams on which Joey Manessis, with his numbers for this season, would not be getting yet another opportunity to be the every game first baseman. I guess we'll see if he is the every game first baseman, but credit to him for uh, capitalizing on that opportunity with a good showing in this game on Wednesday. The best part of this was he hit the ball hard and to the pull side and in the air, (laughs) which is not something that he has done nearly enough of this year. The double right down the line, the single was hard hit also to left field. So I liked to see that. We've seen so much from him, just these ground balls up the middle or little floaters to right center field. He's got to start hitting the ball with more authority to the pull side if he's going to turn into the kind of run producer that they need him to be. So good for him for having that kind of night and doing that. And it sort of feels like, maybe we've said this before, but it does feel like this is maybe last best chance for him to really earn his spot here longer term. Gallo's going to be out for a little while. We discussed last night how they could go for more of a traditional first baseman and Juan Yepes. They didn't do that. They called up Trey Lipscomb, who could get some time at first base. But I think the majority of the time, it's going to be Manessis. He has always tried to make the argument that when he plays in the field regularly, it makes him a better hitter. He feels more engaged in the game. Here's your chance. It's kind of put up or shut up time. Let's see it. And in the first game, he did a really nice job of uh, underscoring what he's been trying to say all along. Now he's got to do it again. And if he can, maybe he can earn his way back into really a part of this team as they look ahead. If he can't, it may not be so simple when Gallo comes back to say, well, the guy who replaced him is the one who's going to go back down. If Lipscomb has any kind of success and if they don't want to keep jerking him up and down all year between AAA and the majors, there's another move to be made. And maybe that move at that point could be Manessis. Yeah, speaking of Trey Lipscomb and the jerking, so this is stint number three for him at the major league level this season. March 30th to April 15th, then April 24th to May 17th, and now him being brought back up to the majors on Wednesday. When he last got sent down, we had the conversation, and I said to you, I want this to be it for him going up and down this season. Like, this needs to stop. This isn't good for his development. I know the Nats aren't, like, doing this on purpose, but this isn't good. When you have someone who you value to at least some degree as a prospect and you keep bringing them up, sending them down, bringing them up, sending them down, well, they have brought him back up again. I would love to say, hey, this needs to be it. He now needs to stay at the major league level the rest of this season. I don't have a lot of faith that that's going to be happening here. And him not being in the lineup on Wednesday evening would seem to speak to that. What do you think the thinking is with Trey Lipscomb in this uh, latest stint at the major league level? I am really fascinated to see how this goes. He's going to be playing multiple positions, third base, second base, first base, maybe even left field in, uh, under certain situations. He's going to give other guys like Senzel, Manessis, Garcia a chance to DH at times. Davey reiterated again, if he's up here, he's going to play. So he does not want him just sitting on the bench. I think this was maybe a, hey, you just flew in. Let's give you a day to kind of get settled in again, and then we'll see. I would assume he'll be in the lineup on Thursday. But let's be clear, it's not like he produced a lot when he was here. Now, he had better numbers in the majors than he did at AAA, to be honest. And we know he's played pretty clean defense. But Nick Senzel is starting to play better. So I don't think it's a given you just bump him. We know Luis Garcia has done a nice job. And I don't see 
Trey Lipscomb being an everyday first base option, not the way that he has hit to this point. I know Manessas hasn't hit much either, but there's at least a chance with him maybe of hitting with some more authority. So I think it is this super utility role, and you try to get four or five days a week you can get him in there somewhere. The hope would be he starts producing enough that they say, yes, we want to keep him around and we'll find a spot for him moving forward. If it doesn't happen, you do start to think, okay, maybe this is the ceiling of what he can be. You're allowed five options per year. You don't want to do that, obviously, in a perfect world. But this is number three, and you hope it sticks, but it doesn't necessarily have to if he doesn't live up to what they want him to be. I mean, this is number three before the middle of June is official, right? We're not even at June 15th yet, and it's already been three times with him this season. That really is something. I mean, I would just say this. I know that Lipscomb is not like a top 100 prospect, but again, he is pretty well regarded within the Nats organization. At least he was coming into this season. I still think even with the Nats doing well, relatively speaking, the rebuild still should take precedence over like trying to contend this season. And so I want to see Lipscomb get an opportunity here. Like, let's kind of see what he is. Let's see what he can become. And when Joey Gallo is healthy, if Lipscomb is showing anything, don't make the automatic move to just send Lipscomb back down. Like, you may have to do the uncomfortable thing of optioning Joey Manessis to AAA or something like that. Because again, Lipscomb offers upside with Manessis you know, (laughs) there ain't no upside there, man. Like, I think we've seen what we're going to see. I mean, August and September of 2022 is a long time ago now at this point. So I am, like you, curious to see how they use Lipscomb, want to see him do better. But I wonder if maybe he would do better if his season had more coherence to it. I mean, it's just been a very choppy, disjointed season for him with the way he's gone up and down, I feel like. It's not the way you would draw it up. It just, it really isn't. And I was thinking about this earlier in the day as well. In some ways, that great spring that he had, he hit 400, playing great defense, might have been the worst thing that could happen to him because it all of a sudden raised the bar and it made people aware of him and it made people think, hey, this guy is something. He deserves to be lumped in with the other top prospects. and He might be the first one who's ready. And the, you know they were strongly considering and putting him on the opening day roster. Maybe that was all warranted. And maybe ultimately he does turn into that player. But so far, I think what we've seen says it may, he may not be quite – what he looked like he was or what they hoped he would be in spring training. Now, there's a long way to go. I want to see him have a legitimate opportunity to play here wherever that may be. If not, then let him go at AAA and don't feel the need to call him up every time something happens. It's pretty remarkable. Three times he's been called up each time when somebody else went on the IL. But look at who the three were. The first one was when Nick Senzel fractured his finger on opening day. The second one was Lane Thomas busting up his knee in late April. And now the third one's Joey Gallo, a hamstring injury in June. That's replacing a third baseman, a right fielder, and a first baseman. It's not like he just automatically replaces somebody who plays the same position. It's clear they view him as the next man up no matter what, and his versatility helps in that regard. But you do this and you've got to say, is he just that quadruple A guy who you call on when somebody else goes down? Or is he actually a part of this and you want to see what he can do and can he stick up here now? Well, game three for the Nats at the Tigers Thursday afternoon at 110. And Patrick Corbin will be the Nats starting pitcher. Mackenzie Gore was supposed to be the Nats starting pitcher for this game, but he has a fingernail issue. And so his next start will be on Friday evening in game one of a three game series against the Miami Marlins at Nationals Park. And Patrick Corbin, whose next turn in the rotation was being skipped, Well, I guess you could say his uh, next turn was delayed, but he was supposed to pitch, if you go by the turn this past Tuesday, he's going to end up pitching on Thursday. So it ends up being just a two-day delay, but we do see Corbin at the Tigers as opposed to him not pitching in the series. Yeah, again, not exactly how they had it planned out, but Gore has this little bit of an issue. Does not sound severe. He told them one extra day should be enough and that he'd be good to go on Friday. Remember, he dealt with something like this late last season actually ended his season a week or two early. You hope it's not anything that lingers more than that. I understand, you know, you're being careful with it. And because Corbin was on extra rest, there was no need to like call somebody else up or do an IL move, anything like that. So it it makes sense. You slide him right into it. A little disappointing in the bigger picture because you're thinking, okay, this might be the first sign of them backing off of him. I guess the good news is they won the first two games of the series. Whatever happens on Thursday is kind of um, cherry on top of the Sunday. This is going to be one of those 
Patrick Corbin's given his 100 pitches, six innings, no matter what kind of game, because we don't know who's available out of the bullpen. Maybe they score a bunch of runs. They can win the game, keep the winning streak going. If not, you live with it and you say, okay, live to fight another day and, and have Gore on the mound Friday night. Well, and again, these are not the 1984 Detroit Tigers. These are not the 2006 Detroit Tigers. This Tigers team has not been impressive <laughs> so far in this series. So if Patrick Corbin is going to have another good start this season, it would seem that Thursday afternoon at Detroit would be a prime opportunity for that. This installment of the Nat Chat podcast brought to us by Mason Kalfas and his team of 10 legal recruiters at Zenith Legal in Washington, D.C. Check out Mason's website today, zenithlegal.com, or call or text Mason at any time, 202-486-3535. You tell us what you think. Hit us up on X at Nats underscore chat. You can email the show, NatsChatPodcast at gmail.com. We have a website that you can check out as well, NatsChatPodcast.com, in which you can purchase a Nats Chat Podcast t-shirt. We always appreciate the support very much. All Nationals radio highlights on Nats Chat are courtesy of 106.7 The Fan. So for Mark Zuckerman, I'm Al Galdi. We thank you for listening, and we will talk to you next time on the Nats Chat Podcast. But before we go, we're going to leave you with something special, a certain song that we had some fun with all the way back in June 2000. 21, the last time that the Nats had a winning streak of at least five games in a regular season. This song, We Are the Washington Nationals. It was part of some good times in June of 2021, and so we'll have some fun with it here right now in June of 2024. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time on the Nats Chat Podcast. They said that since I worked full-time, I wouldn't be able to go to school. But with WGU, I was able to do my classes on my own time and take all my tests online when it suited me best. Learn more at WGU.edu.